Shalom, my brothers and sisters. It's an honor to be with you in this important time and this important um, endeavor to pray for our nation's future, to pray for the coming election. This election is one of the most critical of elections in our nation's history. The issues are dramatic, they are stark, they are clear, they are radically opposed to one another. And it is so crucial because the issues deal with life and death, with morality and immorality, with our, our children's future, the indoctrination of our children, the mutilation of our children, what America is going to be or not, the future of free speech, the future of the gospel, of ministries, of the truth, and even Israel. So first of all, if we have the chance to vote and we don't, then we are, we are ceding the ground. We are giving in. We become accomplices because if we could stop one person from being killed, uh, one baby from being aborted, one child from being mutilated, one person to be saved, and we don't do anything about it, and when we could have done it, and it's not hard to do, then we will be held accountable. The Lord said, I will hold the watchman accountable for the blood of those who perished. So we need to do everything we can. We are given a vote to touch the realm. We are, we are called the light of the world. We are to affect all. And I'll, I'll get more into that, but let, let me, let's look at some of the issues. It's not about the people. We need to pray for all people, but it is about the issues. And on one side, you have in the Democratic ticket, you have the most radical ticket in American history for any mainstream uh, political candidate for president and vice president. In fact, the one who was running for president, Kamala Harris, was ranked as either the number one or number two most leftist senator in the entire United States Senate. And the, the issues are radical. The issue of abortion, the killing of, of the unborn, that is central. That's not just society, that's central to this candidacy. And, and Kamala Harris has promised that she will enact, if given the chance, she'll enact a law that will wipe away every protection for babies in America, every single protection for the unborn, wipe away everything that people have done in every state to try to limit abortion, wiped away. And basically, she believes, as does her running mate, although they won't admit it publicly if they can help it, therefore, abortion up to the point of birth. There are even states now that have that, but they are for that. So it is, that alone would be enough, but it's not alone. It's not just that this ticket believes in these things which are against the Bible and against God and against life. But it is also that under with Kamala Harris, she has literally waged war against those who uphold God's ways. Waged war. Uh, and it could be called e very easily persecution. While she was the Attorney General of California, she, number one, sought to force Christian or conservative ministries to hand over their donor lists to the government. That's just not done. Um, secondly, let me put this back here. Hold it. She also sought to force pro-life pregnancy centers to refer their people to abortion clinics, to force them. They're trying to save babies, and she sought to force them by law, using the government, using law, to force them to promote abortion. It's so radical that it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court overruled her. But that says a lot. And, and here's another thing that she did, and that should, should, should scare us, because it's a warning. Because there was a man called David Delayden, and David Delayden, he uncovered, he exposed Planned Parenthood's trafficking, selling, uh, merchandising of baby parts, aborted baby parts. It, he should have been celebrated, honored, awarded, but, but 
Kamala Harris met with leaders of Planned Parenthood. She basically has become an instrument of Planned Parenthood. And she met with them, they came up with a plan. Uh, uh, shortly afterwards, she had, she had the home of David Daleiden's, his house raided. They came in, they took away, his, with, his, with his, took things from his computer, took away the tapes that damned, exposed Planned Parenthood, took it away, and took away his personal information. I mean, this is something that is done in police states. And not just police states, but anti-Christ police states, uh, like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. And then she used obscure laws or used laws that had never been used in this way before to bring David Daleiden to court, to trial, to seek for his imprisonment. And she leveled against him about 14 or 15 felonies for exposing evil, she has put him on trial to get him put in prison. That's how evil this is. And if this ticket or this agenda becomes wins and becomes the, the guiding ruling ticket, ruling government, then this is gonna become America or it's gonna move in that direction. That's persecution. That is the that involves the the encroachment on the gospel, and so that's how high the stakes are. Now, just recently, someone you, you may have heard, two Christian students were at her rally and they shouted out, "Jesus is Lord." That's basic and simple, and that's was a given, not long ago in our culture. But her response was, "You're at the wrong rally." In other words, if you say Jesus is Lord, you're at the wrong rally. You don't belong in her rallies, her campaign, her people. You don't belong. And so if, if she wins or this ticket wins, then Amer the, the America is going to become that rally. And it will be that Christians don't belong. They don't belong. Except there won't be another rally. She said, at the same time, she said, well, you guys... You belong with a rally down the street. She's talking about Donald Trump. But that what an amazing sign because it's saying that, well, if you say Jesus is Lord in your life, then you don't belong in our campaign. You belong in his campaign. What a thing. That came from her. And that brings us to the other side, Donald Trump and the Republicans. He is not perfect. We know that. He is far from that. We know that. He says things we wish he wouldn't say. He does things... We wish he wouldn't do, etc. But God will use whom he will use. And Donald Trump was virtually single-handedly responsible for the overturning of Roe versus Wade by appointing the three, three Supreme Court justices he appointed. And he sought to do that, and he didn't know other president has ever done that. Donald Trump also... Is the, spoke for life, sought to take action against funding abortion from the government. He, um, he sought to give Christians a voice. He also was the first president in American history to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And other presidents said they would do it, but they never did. He did. He's the first world leader to, of, to actually recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, of any major leader. So there are amazing things that happened there. And again, it's, it's not about him. God will use whom he will use, and he will speak through whom he will speak, and he will accomplish his will. And so the point is this. What, you know, are there some concerns? Yes. You know, the stand on life and the stand on other things, gender. But the, the two platforms are light years apart. And the two candidates are light years apart on the issues. It's, it's one thing to maybe, you know, we'd hope that someone might be stronger in defending against evil. But it's another thing when someone is siding with evil and advocating for its, its advance in the culture in our lives. So we need to vote. If we don't vote, we, ha we cannot say, you cannot complain when the, when the nation falls, when, the, when it affects your children and your grandchildren. You can't complain if he didn't do anything about it. So we have to. The Lord called us to be 
light of the world. Light is active. It's an active agent. It touches everything. We have to touch everything, every realm. We don't put our trust in the political realm. We don't put our hope in the political realm or, or the cultural realm, but we have to touch it. We have to affect it. We have to touch and affect the darkness wherever it is. So that's the first thing. But we also, the, the second part is this. Whoever sits in the White House or the Capitol, the Senate and the, the House and the Supreme Court, we know who sits on the throne. And the one who sits on the throne isn't elected. He's not the president, he's the king. And God rules, and God will rule no matter what. He may do it one way, and in another case, he may do it another way. But God's purposes continue. Politics makes a difference. It can open a window, for, for example, for revival, or it can close a window. But God's purposes will still go forward. And we have to be resolved that no matter what, we're going to go for it. Um, no matter what, whether it's easy to, well, it's never totally easy, but it's easy to preach the gospel and, and fulfill his will, or it's hard in the mountains or in the valleys. We're going to go forward in God. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to speak the truth. We're going to go forward, do his will, minister, and whether in the light or the dark, the day or the night. And so that has to be our, our ultimate, our ultimate resolve and commitment. But then there's the other side, kind of point three. And that is, yes, we have to touch every realm and touch government. But we know that the only hope is God and the only hope is his spirit and America turning to God and revival. Because if we change the government, but we don't change the people, the people will change the government back. If we change the laws, but don't change the hearts, then the unchanged hearts will change the changed laws back. Without revival, America is gone. It's not a nice thing, it's the only thing. And so we need to pray for revival more than anything. And, and it's, that's what I wanna to talk to you about. I mean, we pray for the election, pray for revival, pray for, we have to pray. But I wanna give you some encouragement. And this is from, uh, you know, ultimately, this is from, um, from the very history of America. And I want to say, you know me, many of you know me first from the book, The Harbinger. And that is the warning that's still unfolding, still coming true. America's racing away from God and racing to judgment. So it's a matter of life and death. Only revival. God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. If my people, if my people. The year was 1863. America was in the Civil War in the midst of it, and things were looking gloomy for the Union, for America to hold together. Uh, the Union was, was facing loss after loss, Lincoln could not find a general he could really put his trust in. Each one failed or disappointed, or many of them did. And it looked like it could go the other way. And if it did, it didn't mean that America wouldn't exist. It mean that maybe America would exist in two split forms, and it wouldn't be the, the nation we have today. And then it would have affected world history. It would be all altered. But... It was then in 1863 in the springtime that Abraham Lincoln issued a call for a day of national prayer and repentance. They called it back then humiliation, meaning humbling before God, if my people. So they did, and it happened. Now, about two months later, something happened. It was the turning point of the entire war. You know it. It was the Battle of Gettysburg. Two months later, on July 3rd, the Confederacy suffered its most dramatic, uh, massive defeat. It was, the, it was the, the, the high point of the Confederacy. From that moment on, everything would go down. The next day came the other turning point. It was the, the fall of the city of Vicksburg and, by, and, and under Ulysses Grant. And this was crucial. 
it was like this was the dividing of the nation and this was the breakthrough. So that was enough. But when I looked deeper, and I mentioned this in the Josiah, I brought this out in the Josiah Manifesto. When I went deeper, I saw something. And that is, that was the turning point of the war. But the turning point of the turning point, well, with Gettysburg, it happened with a war just before it that really opened the door for everything that happened at Gettysburg. And that happened the day after the National Day Prayer, the next day. That was the turning point of the turning point. So you could say that's the turning point. With Vicksburg, the turning point came also the day after the National Day of Prayer. It was the first victory they had. It was Grant's first victory. He crossed over, and that would lead to the fall of of Vicksburg. It happened the very next day. Now think about that. If What if they didn't pray? What if Lincoln didn't call for prayer? What if God's people did not pray and seek his face? America might not exist as we know it. And how would that have affected the world? Imagine if America wasn't there in a united form when Hitler rose and took over Europe. Imagine if America wasn't there when the Soviet Union rose and took over Eastern Europe. Imagine the whole world could have become communist or Nazi or fascist or totalitarian. But it didn't because America was there and it was the prayers of God's people that affected America being America for surviving and then everything that happened from that, including the defeat of Hitler, the defeat of communism. Don't ever underestimate the power of the prayer of God's people. Now, I wasn't there in 1863, but I was there for the next one I'm going to tell you about. It was a a year when and not just a year, where America was falling. And it was the late 70s and 1980, and America was falling, was was all over. The economy was in shambles. The economy was falling apart. Um, Double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, people online to get gas, uh, America's prestige all around the world declining. The Soviet Union was advancing in Afghanistan. Um, And then in Iran... They took hostage 52 Americans. And every night, Americans turned on their television set and said, death to America. The chanting from Tehran, the multitudes chanting death to America. It looked like it was going to, it was the end of the American age. And then President Carter sent in helicopters to a rescue mission to rescue the hostages. But disaster came. The helicopters crashed into each other. In the desert, the servicemen were killed. The Iranians took the bodies and displayed them as they chanted death to America. A gloom fell on the nation. And it was just then that God's people gathered in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall. It was called Washington for Jesus. It was, it was set long before this, but it, God had it. That was just then when there was a gloom on the nation. The nation was helpless. And I know it because I was there. I was a new believer. I was a young new believer. And there, I remember two prominent prayers. Everybody joined hands and they prayed that where the nation was helpless and the the Pentagon was helpless, the military was helpless to rescue those hostages, God would move by his own arm, come down and rescue those hostages himself, number one. Number two, at the end of the day, we all lifted our hands to the Capitol, uh, to the west side of the Capitol, and we prayed, God, put in power those of your, of your choice, because the election was coming up. A few months later came the election. This was in the spring. This is now the election comes in November. And it was a revolution in the polls. And people who were promising to carry a, out a godly agenda Righteous agenda were swept into office, and the most prominent of them was named Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan took the oath of office in a new place. the, The inauguration had always been held on the east side of the Capitol, facing the Supreme Court, since I don't maybe the time of Andrew Jackson, well over a century. But all of a sudden, they decided to change it. It wasn't Reagan who decided. The committee decided to change it, and now they put it on the west side of the Capitol the very side that was facing 
where God's people prayed, if my people, and by the way, the theme was if my people of that day, if my people, if my people call by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their evils, I'll hear from heaven, I'll heal their land. Well, now he's there where we were praying. And not only that, he's standing, the inauguration, the inaugurations have taken place in that same place ever since, but it was a few months before that we prayed there for God to have his way there. And now Reagan is standing on the very steps where we had placed our hands, pointed our hands for God to put there the people of his choice. And it's been there ever since. But not only that, not only that prayer, but in the very, on the very same day and the very same hour when Reagan was inaugurated in that place, overlooking the National Mall, the 52 hostages were released from Iran. Two prayers in one day linked to the same place where, we, where the prayers were prayed. And everything turned. The history of America turned. You know, the economy came back. America's prestige came back. It was called mourning in America. It was a boom in every way, prospering. And America w became so strong that it contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union. And Eastern Europe, communism fell in Eastern Europe. But it all went back to that. And the moment it turned is when, when Reagan lifted his hand to swear in the oath of office on those steps. And his other hand, people didn't see it, was on the Bible. It wasn't just in the Bible, it was on a particular verse from the Bible. And it was there because his mother had marked it out for him. It was his mother's Bible. And she said, basically, this, this, she wrote down, this is for the healing of nations. What was the verse? It was, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And so God did. And all that happened, even the fall of the Soviet Union, all the millions who were set free in Eastern Europe, it began with the prayers of God's people. They changed history. More important than kings are the prayers of God's people. You may not see it right away, but God hears. The next one, I was also there. And this time I was able to lead it with a man named Kevin Jessup, a man of God. And we were led to have a national day of prayer and repentance on the National Mall in the midst of COVID. And it was just before the election. And we were there. We didn't even know if we were going to be able to have it. People came in masks and they had to separate and we didn't even know that they were going to open it up for us. You know, this, this, everybody was still, people were locked down. People weren't traveling. There were, um, it was just had the riots of the summer. But by miracle, we didn't even know, but it opened up. And it was on the day of the return, what happened to fall on the biblical day called the day of, of Shuva. Shuva means return. We didn't even realize it. It was on the day of the return, it was on the day of the return and repentance. And it was their same thing, to repent, to seek, humble ourselves, seek and pray and seek God's face and turn from our evil ways. And so we did. And I was led to bring a clay jar to the National Mall, as Jeremiah did, and smash it there. And I did. And the thing is, Jeremiah smashed that jar overlooking the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom. That's where they killed their children. And that was the, you know, we, we spoke about everything, but that was a real focus of that day, is the blood of the children that we had shed. And at five o'clock, I, I said, we got to seal all the prayers now. And with the sounding of God's power, the sounding of the shofar. So I called up men, they sounded the shofar. But only when I said, I said, now, we seal all the prayers we have prayed here. And when you hear the sound, it says, now let the power of God go forth to the world. And I said, when you hear that, everybody shout Jericho. Shout the shout of Jericho. I said, go. The trumpet sounded. The people shouted. It turned out on the very day that as we pray that the same day, President Trump chose that same day to initiate what would be the overturning of Roe versus Wade. It was the nominating of Amy Barrett. That was the third last Supreme Court. That was the, that was the deciding vote. Nominated on the day of repentance and turning for a nation to turn away from evil, its sin. But it wasn't only that. 
he set it in motion. But it wasn't just the same day, but the same hour when we sealed all those prayers, when we sounded that shofar, the same minute. I said, let the power of God go forth to the world in, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, and I said, go. It was five o'clock, four minutes and 33 seconds. At that moment, President Trump opened his mouth and set in motion the overturning of Roe versus Wade. At five o'clock, four minutes and 33 seconds. The exact day, the exact hour, the exact minute, the exact moment as the people shouted and the trumpets went forth. This also altered the course of our nation. And it was God's hand and it was the prayers of God's people. Now, I just came back from Washington where we had the Million Women um, event also called The Last Stand and the Esters and um, wasn't just women, but it was focused that way. And I was led to, at the end or near the end, to smash the altar of Ishtar. This is the goddess of sexual immorality, of, of uh, the destruction of manhood, womanhood, destruction of marriage, of families, the sexual revolution, the altering of gender, specifically the turning men into women and women to men from ancient times. This is in the return of the gods and the mutilation of children and people, others as well. Well, I, we did that. We prayed the casting out. Now, I don't know what God's going to do. I have ideas, but I don't know. God knows though, but I know God is going to act. God is going to hear our prayers. Things already started happening. You know, one of the things that were prayed is that one person prayed. That we prayed that the hostages in Israel would be released. So it was, but prayed also that somebody prayed that they would be able to stop the man Sinwar, the head of Hamas. About four days later, it happened, and it was an accident. But God's going to hear that. Now the thing is this: now we have this gigantic election coming up, and it will determine much of the future. We need to pray. God will hear your prayers. We may not see it right away. You know, we didn't see the effects of, of the return right away. But when we saw it, it actually happened the very second when we were there. Uh, the, with, with the Washington for Jesus, with that rally, that gathering, it happened months later, but boy, did it happen. With Lincoln, it happened two months later, but it happened. And the beginning happened right then, but nobody could see it. God will hear our prayers. So let's pray for the election. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray not only for the revival of this nation, but for our own revival too, because that's how it begins. And let's commit to it. So let's pray now. Join me. Let's pray together. Father, we just praise you and thank you and bless you and lift you up. We ask your blessing on all things. Have your way. Lord, we ask that you would now, Lord, Father, have your way with this election. We ask, Father, put into power those of your choice, of your choosing, those who will do your will. Lord, we, Lord, we trust you'll use people no matter what. But we pray, Lord, people who first would, our first prayer is people who seek your will and, and seek to glorify you. Lord, let, let them come to power. Father, we ask, Father, that you have your way no matter what. And Lord, have your way in this nation. We ask, Lord, Father, for religious freedom to stay open, Father. We ask for the freedom of speech to stay strong. Father, we ask for the children, Lord. We ask that you end the indoctrination, end the confusion. Lord, save them, Lord. We ask, Father, for, for Lord, for the babies, Lord, the unborn, Lord, save them. Father, we pray for the, the women who would be caught up in this. Save them out of it, Father. We pray for those who are caught up in sexual immorality. Save them out of it. We pray for those who are caught up in gender confusion. Save them out of it, Lord. Touch them. Touch those who would consider themselves enemies of us. Save them, Lord. Save people in, in government, in the Capitol, in the House, in the White House, in the Supreme Court. In the governorships, have your way, Lord, with all of these. In school boards, Lord, across the night, Lord, we ask, Lord, touch the young. Father, we pray, 
Lord, we pray for revival. No matter what it takes, bring revival to this land. No matter what it takes, bring revival. Lord, we ask that you would touch, Father, the schools, touch the children. That's where it began when we took it out. Touch the children, touch the schools, Father. Touch, touch, Lord, and have your way. Touch, Lord, touch the, Lord, the little children, Lord. Free them from confusion. Lord, touch the, the, the elementary students. Touch the junior high. Touch high schools, Lord, across America. Touch colleges across America. Bring revival. Let there be revival, Lord. Father, we ask for revival. Revival on the, in the heartland, Father. Revival in the coastland. Revival, Lord, in the cities. Revival in the country, Father. We ask revival in the churches, Lord. Lord, touch the pastors. Let them be unafraid, Father. We ask, Lord, you root out a spirit of compromise and fear. Let them preach boldly. Let them become radical like the book of Acts. Lord, let your people be radical on fire like the book of Acts, Lord. Lord, we pray for revival on the government, revival in Washington, D.C. Lord, we pray for revival, Lord, in every all the churches that love you, Lord. A massive revival. Have your way, have your way. Lord, and we pray for this revival of America, Lord, and, to, and revival in the world and the nations. You talk about, Lord, you speak of an end time harvest and the outpouring of the latter rains. Lord, let it be so. We pray for the, the, the Lord, salvation in, and, and revival in Europe, Lord, in South America, Lord, in Canada, North America, in Africa, in Asia, Lord, in India, China, Russia, in the Middle East, Father, in the Islamic world, revival, Lord, salvation in the Hindu world, Lord, in the communist world, Lord, in the nominal Christian world, Lord, in the Islamic world, Lord, let you have your way across, in the occult world, Lord, in the New Age world, Lord, have your way, Lord. In Hollywood, and our culture, touch, touch and bring revival. Use everything, Lord every part of our culture, in the boardrooms, in the corporate world, Lord, bring revival. Whatever it takes, Lord, bring revival. And Father, we ask for our own lives. Bring revival to our own lives, Lord. We ask, Father, we cannot ask for revival if we don't choose revival. It's not just to ask for and pray for, but to choose it, Lord. We choose revival. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. And Lord, we choose repentance, whatever we need to do, to turn away from our evil ways, to put it out, we say yes. Yes, that's how revival begins. And we will seek your face, humble ourselves and pray and seek your face, seek more of you. Whatever we have not said yes to in our lives, Father, we say yes to now. Have your way, Lord. We say yes, we're gonna follow you. We're gonna rise, Lord. Bring revival, Lord. Pour your spirit out on each of us. Renewal, revival. We wanna be on fire, Lord. Radical, like the book of Acts, Father. Let us each fulfill our calling. We praise you, we love you, we thank you, we bless you. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, and the lion of the tribe of Judah, and the king of this land and every land. Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. Now I want to give you a blessing as we seal this together. And here, this is the ancient blessing. It's God's blessing. He himself wrote the words, so it's powerful. And we could also pray it for America, but this is for you and America. Just receive. You can close your eyes and receive. Yivarechecha Adonai vayishmarecha Ya'er Adonai panavlecha vichunecha Yisa Adonai panavlecha v'yasem lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord causes his face to shine upon you, child of God, and pour out his grace. The Lord God lift up the glory of his countenance upon your life, servant of God. For now, upon your home, upon your house, upon the works of your hands, upon your heart, everything and the Lord give you shalom, life, fullness, peace, all the blessings of his love. And we together now, with a blessing, pray that blessing for America. Lord, bless America. Keep America in your will, Lord. Cause your face to shine on America for revival, 
Pour out your grace and mercy upon this land of America. We need it. Lord, lift up your glory on this land and upon the world, Lord, the end time harvest, and give your shalom in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, Adon Olam, the Lord of all, Tikvatenu, and our only hope, Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you, people of God, mighty men and women. Stay strong in the Lord and the power of his might. This is Jonathan Kahn. Shalom.